who is waiting for the pulpit <laughs> to descend from heaven <laughs> or to come from the side somewhere. Let me uh, say that on Thursday, we had a massive community Easter egg hunt. 800 people. In that hunt, if you look carefully, I'm sure, you would see adults scrounging for eggs <laughs> that the children should have. Last night, the grandkids were over, and there was another Easter egg hunt. And in our past, we've had a bunny. I love eggs. I love rabbits. But Easter's not about bunnies and eggs. The only reason Easter exists as a celebration on planet Earth for eons of centuries is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to say to you, He is risen, and your resounding response will be, He is risen indeed. Are you ready? He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Now we're going to split it up. We're going to have the skybox section <laughs> and the ground level people. You know, there were 6,000 people at the University of Hawaii football spring game sitting in the rain yesterday, so we can match that energy. <laughs> All right? You and the rafters, the risers, <laughs> the rafters, <laughs> risers. He is risen. He is risen. Ooh. <laughs> Baby. <laughs> you at ground level. He is risen. You online. <laughs> he is risen. Awesome. <laughs> well, I want to tell you a resurrection story, if I could. And I tell it every, almost every Easter about my friend Mark, who died twice back in 2010. I was teaching a class. I got a call. He had been battling an infirmity for a short period of time. No one really expected him to pass, but pass he did, and I got to the hospital, and his wife Abigail looked at me, smiling with tears coming down her cheeks. Her son was on the side. A similar response, and I was very puzzled, because generally when I show up at a hospital and a loved one has passed, they're not smiling. They're crying, but they're not smiling. And so she said, a most wonderful thing has happened. We prayed for God to intervene, and Mark came back and then left again, which left me totally confused, totally confused. He came back to life angry. Now, you would think you would come back to life happy. He came back to life angry because he had got a taste of the journey from earth to his future hope and future home in heaven. And when you're traveling on that glided path of light with angelic escort, generally, you're waiting for the grand arrival. I surmise that he got a peak of heaven. But then he made a U-turn because he heard the prayers of the people on earth and this church that were so strong that his path changed from going straight and he made a U-turn and he found himself back in his earthly body. How many of you ever made U-turns legally? <laughs> okay. How many of you ever made U-turns illegally? Come on, fess up. It's Easter, all right? <laughs> Jesus is in the house. So, we all have done that. This was a legal, heavenly U-turn. And he woke up very upset, and he said, I want you to let me go. Another way you could put it is, I want you to let me go home. Well, Mark, you are home. But his real home, his future home, was heaven. And when you get a glimpse of it, Everybody I've talked to who've had similar experiences never want to stay on earth 
Do you want to grab a hold of that future hope? And so, he said, I want you to open the windows and the curtains. This was at Queens Hospital. I was there, really nice room. Apparently, he wanted a clear shot on that glided path of life, a light, out the window. In my mind, I guess it's like Superman, right? It's a bird, it's a plane, it's Mark. And he's shooting out that window. This is, this is really funny because apparently on his first trip, that's how he went. And I guess he wanted to help the angels out. He's home now. He's home experiencing the future hope that we all can have beyond this life. Two years of a pandemic, we've seen much suffering. We've seen more people pass than we're comfortable with. Those close to us, those dear to us, those of every generation that we did not expect to precede us. But you know, only God knows when that day comes. We are alive only for the reason of fulfilling God's purpose on this planet. But there is a future inheritance. Until our time comes, God protects us. And he wants to deploy us in a very special way. So our text this Easter, as we launch into this Easter experience, is found in 1 Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded or protected through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So let's break this text down. What is the Word of God speaking to us? What is the Holy Spirit illuminating? What does He want to quicken to us? Three things this morning, on this Easter morning, we want to talk about. First of all, God has reserved the hope of an eternal inheritance for us in heaven. Heaven is our future home, but let me say this. Scripture teaches heaven is our ultimate home home. God brings us or he births us into an eternal inheritance through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God sent his son. Jesus is God in the form of man, and this is the gospel narrative. Jesus, God, is God in the form of man who lived the perfect life a perfectly righteous life fulfilling all of God's requirements and for us. He died the death, paying the penalty for sin that we should have died, but he died in our place. But death couldn't hold him. On the third day, he rose from the dead, breaking the power of sin and death over our lives and its consequences, proving to be the Son of God, such that when we believe in Jesus, we turn from a life apart from following God. When we believe in Him, we are born again by faith into a relationship with the Lord personally and into His family. The words of Jesus, Jesus put it this way. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He is risen. Get a little, sound a little drunk there, okay? Get ready. I might pop this on you as we go. He is risen. He is risen. That's it. That's it. That's it. Because we, this is the truth. This is what Easter rehearses over and over. Now, secondly, what is the passage telling us? God desires to protect us by His power until the appointed time. Take a look at verse 5. We who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So there is an appointed time. There's an appointed time when we come to know Jesus personally. But there's an appointed time where multitudes will come to Jesus globally. That will happen just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ to this earth the return of the Lord known as the parousia. 
He returns. We believe, many believe, we live in the generation that will be alive when Jesus Christ comes back to the earth again. And the, and the events of the pandemic caused many people to reconsider the claims of the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. Matthew 24, Mark chapter 13, Luke chapter 21, all the es eschatological passages. But you know, Jesus said, as much as you want to be aware of the time you live in, most of all, you want to make most of the time you're given. And there is a future purpose, a present purpose, and a future purpose we must fulfill as we prepare for heaven to come. And the future is something we need not be afraid of. In fact, it is something we should look forward to. But there is an appointed time when God will want us to see heaven and enter heaven. For some people, they see it, they come close to it, but they don't get into it, and God just tantalizes them with motivation. We have people like that in our church. And there's people who have seen it and entered it, but the Lord put them on the U-turn and sent them back. And the reason he sends them back is because they're not finished. Their appointed time has not yet come. There is a purpose for them to fulfill. You know, here at Pearlside Church, we say, what is the calling? What is the purpose? What is the, what is the mission, so to speak, to know God, to follow God, to discover your purpose, and to make a difference by helping others do the same? And quite clearly, a man named Don Piper is probably the quintessential example in modern day history. Who is Don Piper? Well, Don Piper was a minister, and today he's an educator, he's a public speaker, he's a motivator, but mostly he is a heaven, a heaven sneak preview expert. Because years ago he was mangled in a car accident where his car collided with an out-of-control 18-wheeler. He was a minister on his way to a conference. Don Piper died, and for 90 minutes, he was in heaven. And for 90 minutes, the Lord showed him a preview of his future hope and his future home. What he especially liked about it was he was no longer in pain or suffering. And he thought he was going to stay. But the Lord says, you ain't staying yet because your appointed time is not yet finished. You have a purpose to accomplish on the earth. Now, the reason I'm talking about Don is he was here less than a year ago. He was here previous to that. And he is the author of the best-selling book, 90 Minutes in Heaven, after which a movie was made. New York Times bestseller. In fact, it stood at first place for many, many weeks, rivaling any other book that was ever written. People want to know about their future hope. They want to know about their future home. They want to know. And the Lord said to Don, I'm sending you back so they can know. Now, why am I telling you that? I'm going to show you a little movie trailer from five years ago, several years ago, because if you haven't read the book yet, you should. If you haven't seen the movie yet, you should. And I've had talks with Don on the side and with his wife that are riveting. The detail, the color of it, and the reality. But here's 47 seconds. He is risen. He is risen. Let's go to the movies real quick. 47 seconds. My name is Don Piper. 26 years ago, I died. When I woke up, I was in heaven. But God had other plans for me. Every day of my life, I ask the same question. Oh Lord, why'd you let me see heaven and take it away? Through his plan, I discovered my purpose is to tell you. God still answers prayers. God still performs miracles. Heaven is real. So the reason Don Piper is still alive is because God wasn't finished with the reason God created him in the first place. 
the reason you are alive is because God's not finished with you and what he's called you to do, to know God, to follow God, to discover his purpose and make a difference in the lives of others by helping them do the same. See, the belief of the American dream that says, I'm alive to make as much money as I can, to gain as much security as I can, and then go to Vegas and golf is not the American dream. That is what we call the American nightmare. But God can bless you with all the resources and all the wealth, and He does so, so we can look beyond ourselves to help people to know God, to follow God, to discover their purpose and make a difference by helping others do the same. You're here this morning because this is what the Lord wants to tell you. You have been living a present purpose, but there is a future purpose that's not about you, but all about Him and helping others. One day we will stand before the Lord to give account for all the abilities, all the resources, all the opportunity, all the stewardship that we've been given as a gift. And the Lord will ask us, what have you done with what you've been given? On May the 1st, we talk about this. That's in two weeks, ah, but not yet. And it's not something, if you know Jesus, you need to be afraid of, because that day will be a day of celebration and reward unspeakable. Now, in talking to Don, he said, for two years after flying around heaven, how many want to fly? Sit, man. I've always wanted to fly without an airplane. He found himself back in his body that had to endure 29 surgeries. He said, I was an angry, dark man for two full years. I was unbearable to live with. This was a man who had just spent 90 minutes in heaven. When he awoke, by the way, he woke up after 90 minutes dead, freaking out the paramedics, freaking out the doctors, and the minister who was praying for his family right next to his corpse that was wrapped up. Dead man singing. He woke up after being 90 minutes. That's good and dead, okay? Some people are sort of dead, and they come back to life. 90 minutes, you are very dead. And he woke up singing strains to amazing grace because he had heard the sounds of heaven and began to sing it with the minister who was singing it at his side. So, documented, this guy was very dead. That's why New York Times' best-selling book became the product and people invested money to make it a movie. You cannot deny the reality of Don Piper's resurrection, but the reality is this. I was angry at God. I wanted nothing of his purpose. I wanted nothing to serve him. I was just angry with him to tantalize me with a trip to my future home and then come back in my suffering body. And one of the things he said that helped him break through, he says, Jesus spoke to him and said, Don, now you know how much I loved you and how much I loved the world because I also suffered as you have suffered. And he said, somehow that made sense. And something took place inside of him. He healed and he's dedicated his entire life to heal others. And he's still living today. He's having a blast but he's not afraid of dying. He said, I'm not afraid of dying. I died before, and I know where I'm going. Heaven is very real, and you're going to love it. But not until the Lord's appointed time arrives on earth. What do we do? There's stuff for us to do. The gifts, abilities, the talents, even the temperament that you have, all of your experiences can converge into new beginnings this Easter. God wants to give you clarity about your future purpose. That is to give future hope to many who are walking their way out of the pandemic and restrictions and fear. Listen to me. 
by the word of God, no virus formed against us shall prosper. It is time to choose faith over fear because Scripture says without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You and I have a DNA of believing in God. We are all made in God's image. Genesis 1.26 says we are made in the image of God to look like God, to illuminate God, to reflect God, and to bring Him glory. You say, what does God look like? He looks like all of us put together, red and yellow, black and white. We are precious in His sight. That's why I tell people I'm black. <laughs> I love black music. I play black funk. On the inside, I look like Anthony Holyfield, but you just don't know it. <laughs> or a Kenny Tingsley, for that matter. All the African Americans, all the brothers say amen. 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 Okay, that's good. <laughs> Listen to me. We all are reflect the image of God. So there, with that is a DNA to believe. There is, we are created with a measure of faith. But you know what? Truthfully, most people don't discover that faith until there's adversity. But let's close with this. How do you like that? When I say let's close, everybody starts having a happy thought. <laughs> God redeems our life's adversity, so we find and refine our faith, a faith that's latent in us that we are made. You just need a situation to create a resurrection for that faith. Look at verse 7. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The author Peter is writing during a time when Christians are being persecuted, some put to death. The world would say injustice. This was beyond the cancel culture. And through this, Peter writes with gospel faith, he says, testing is simply, the trial of your faith is simply the trail to your triumph. Many of you are going through tests, you have gone through tests, and you've questioned about tomorrow. Why am I here? What's my next step? How do I help my brother, my sister, my husband, my wife, my children, my uncle, my auntie? What does the future look like in a post-pandemic world? Well, the Lord hasn't forgotten you. He's charted your future. And when you surrender your life to Him, He will make it very clear about your next step and your next steps, your next place, and your ultimate hope. His gift to you is, I, He says, I will give you a hope and a future. So, our response to life's fiery tests out of, out of adversity is meant to reveal and to glorify God. Our own David Char, who was in the first service, had built a life of affluence, success, and wealth. He would have achieved what all of us would call the American dream, only thing that he find out as he wrote that story, it was not quite the story God had for him. And so battling a life and death condition, God rewrote the story. And David invites you to participate this Easter morning in his story. Meet David Char. Becoming successful at work, getting promoted, and building wealth, that was my God. I literally put in 15 hours a day, seven days a week, if that's what it took, and relationships weren't important. It literally destroyed my first marriage and all the relationships with my family. When I got divorced from my first wife, it was devastating. And I knew that I had a lot to do with it, and it really, I mean, it, it hurt. All through that too, my relationship with my children did just deteriorated and the relationship with the rest of my family, my mom, my brothers, my dad, I mean that that suffered an awful lot too.
So, but it didn't matter to me. Day after Christmas 2019, I started having these stomach pains and my wife told me, you better get to the emergency room. My gallbladder was bad, so they kept me overnight and they removed my gallbladder. It ended up being it was an infected gallbladder. Another time they took me into the hospital for low sodium, you know, and I stayed there for five days. Then another time, you know, I ended up in the emergency room again, you know, and um, they, I had low hemoglobin, so they did a colonoscopy and an endoscopy on me and it found that I had ulcers, you know. Then I started having more health issues, you know, where I couldn't swallow food and I couldn't sleep, you know. There's this lady that I work with, Penny. For years, she's been always inviting me to come to the services. And, you know, I always told her, yeah, I will, but I never did. So finally, after I had just gotten out of the hospital, she told me, David, the Lord is giving you so many chances. You really need to get to know him. So finally, with the last health scare, I told him, you know, maybe you can watch the sermon on YouTube. After I got the link, to the YouTube service. I just watched the service and it, to me it was just amazing. It was as if that sermon was meant specifically for me. At the end of the service, are you willing to say this prayer, you know, to receive the Lord? After that invitation, you know, I prayed that prayer to receive the Lord. I felt as though the Lord had my back. He was with me. After I received the Lord, he revealed to the doctor's that actually it was a brain tumor that was causing all these conditions. So because of that now, you know, I should have died because of all the conditions I was having, but when he revealed their brain tumor, they were able to start treating me. Then after that, all the small groups started to start praying for me. And once they started praying for me, miraculously, I just started, healing started to come really fast of all the different symptoms that were actually killing me, to tell you the truth, yeah. After I got out of the hospital, I told Pastor Eric, I really need to meet these, these guys that were praying for me. And, you know, I got to meet all of them. It's my group where I can share everything with them and they don't judge me. All they do is they try to help me and they pray for me. So God did a 180 degree turn in his heart, you know, where once, David would always be talking about what he knew and who he knew, but now, you know, he prays. He said he goes on his prayer walks. When he talks to people, he talks to them about Jesus. He's healed so many relationships for me. You know, he's healed my relationship with my wife now, with all my children, with my mom. For the first 66 years of my life, not once did I ever tell my mom that I loved her. And not once did she ever tell me that she loved me. Today, when I call her, every day, I tell her I love her, and every day she tells me she loves me. Things that I thought were important before, all of a sudden are not as important. I know the Lord will always provide for me now. I don't need to accumulate all this wealth so that I then worry about, boy, how I'm gonna live when I'm 80 or 90 years old. I, I know the Lord will provide for me. And that tumor is, it's still no longer there. I mean, I'm not out of the woods, I guess, because I still have to do annual MRIs, but hey, I'm in a really good place right now, let me tell you. And now David Char, indeed, it's a living, walking, breathing miracle. And now he understands that Everything he has is for a greater purpose beyond his wealth, beyond himself. And there's a joy and an anticipation and an enthusiasm that's radiating from this man because at age 66, that's young, come on, 66 is the new 26. No, no, it's not. It's 66 is maybe the new 46. How's that? That's believable, right? Okay, I'm 67, so I'd have to say stuff like that. Life's beginning only for him because he realizes now everything he's gone through, including the suffering, is going to bring hope to others. Because we connect not through our victories. We connect through our pain. We connect through the empathy and the comfort we experience from connecting with others who's also gone through rough times. And that's why Jesus came and suffered so we can connect with a Messiah 
a Savior, a God who understands everything we have gone through and everything we will ever go through. And he's still alive, David is, because God's future purpose is yet to be accomplished. That's why you're alive. Great day. The great day when you're born. Second great day is to find out why you were born. And that only becomes clear when you receive Jesus. When he becomes the center of your life and he becomes your world and your everything. God so loved the world and he so intensely and immensely loves you that he gave his only begotten son. David Char's life pivoted on a word of faith spoken as a prayer of faith. And here's what the Bible says about that word. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified or made righteous as if you've never sinned. With the mouth, one confesses and is saved. That means you are made whole. You are set free, not only from the consequences of sin, but that word saved means there is a power for God to set you free from everything that's held you captive because we all have stuff growing up in this rough life. So we believe, we believe we receive through a word of faith and a prayer of faith the Lord into our hearts. We are born again at that moment into the kingdom and the family of God and to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. An awesome, awesome moment. And I want to take a moment right now to do just that. If you would bow your heads. Just close your eyes and focus on the Lord the best you can. Know that he wants to take the broken pieces of your life, maybe like shards of glass. He wants to reassemble them so that you can look into that mirror and see that the Lord made you in his image, not, what, not in the image of what others have said, mean things, not even perhaps what you have told yourself, but as you look into that mirror, you can see that God made you in His image. And in that mirror, He also wants you to see Him. And so, Father, I pray that be a real experience. If you're here, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died to pay the penalty for your sins, that he rose again on Easter to break the power of sin over your life, to redeem you from the penalty of sin, then to believe must be followed by the act that receives. And through that word or prayer of faith that David Char prayed, I want to present you an opportunity. If you've never received Christ, and surrendered your life to him as Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. Now, I want to be clear as your heads are bowed. I'm not talking to Christians. But if you're here, and say if your life ended today and you wouldn't be sure that you would be in heaven, then you're not saved. It's as clear as that. And Scripture and the Holy Spirit behooves you to become saved today. That's why I believe the Lord led you here. That's why you were invited here. Don't leave here without preparing for there. And so, if that's you, you've been a seeker, you've been on the edge, or you're not sure, pray this prayer in your heart as the Christians in the congregation pray it aloud. And then at the end, because Scripture says to confess your faith publicly, I will be the witness asking for a show of hands of those who cross the line of faith. No Christian will be raising their hand because they know. But seekers in the house, or those that are not sure, I want to encourage you. The angels of heaven rejoice when you make your faith public. So if that's you, and you're moving from death into life, 
Pray this prayer in your heart as we go line by line and the Christians in the house pray it out loud. Dear Lord, I believe you are the Son of God, that you died for my sins, that you paid my penalty. You shed your blood for my cleansing. I believe you rose from the dead, breaking the power of sin over my life. Lord, come into my heart. Take over my life. I surrender to you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Now, with every head bowed, here's the moment, a precious moment of confession. You prayed to receive the Lord today. Not talking to Christians. You prayed to receive the Lord today. On the count of three, me as your witness, and of course, heaven itself, could you lift your hands up high? One, two, three. Okay, up high. I'm watching. Okay. Now, there are also some of you, you're not sure. You need to know more. And you have opportunity for some next steps to be able to take where we teach you about how to get there. How do you process the Word of God? How, you, how do you find and refine and clarify faith? You'll hear about that after this portion is done, before the service is out. But I do want to say, the decision that you made today will determine the rest of your life. How about a hand for those who received the Lord here this morning? <laughs> Welcome to the family of God. But also, Father, we pray <clears throat> excuse me, that you will bring a fresh focus, a fresh revelation <clears throat> of why we're here and how we should live. That we would know more clearly how to know God, follow God, yes. But we would discover our purpose with fresh revelation and make a difference by helping others do the same. And so, Lord, thank you for taking the broken pieces of our past, assembling a brand new mirror so we can see a brand new image that we are made in the image of not what others say we are, but who you and your word says we are. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.